As many of you know, as Joshua already said, Brother Randy is out this week. Uh, he's living it up in Israel, which all of us, I, I think, have a, a dream one day to go there. Uh, it, it's probably a life uh, experience that many of us, some of you maybe have already been able to do it, many of us would want to do. Uh, like he said, about 40, 30 uh, people from our church went, and they joined another church in Nashville. And so they're all over there. And if you guys have Facebook, you can see how good of a time they're really having. It's so cool. I, we actually saw some pictures, I think it was about three days ago now, uh, of Randy baptizing some people in the Jordan, which is just so mind-blowing to me. Uh, it's cool to see our senior pastor have an opportunity to do that with some of our, our members. Uh, like I always say, I'm so blessed when Randy comes to my office and says, hey, I need you to preach. Um, it's a little different than students. As many of you know, I'm the student pastor here. And uh, I, love, I love your students. I absolutely love your students. But when I get to speak on a Sunday morning, it's a privilege and an honor. And it's, it's really one of the callings that God's put on my life. And so I really appreciate that. And I thank the church and Brother Randy for it. So today we're going to start uh, a single sermon. And God laid this sermon on my heart after Randy had asked me to preach. Uh, and it's, it's titled very simply, Standing Strong in the Storm. Uh, it's not just standing in the storm, it's standing strong in the storm. And many of you may know, if you live in the area, which all of us probably do, uh, we've had a lot of storms hit us pretty recently. Uh, May was a hard month for Oklahoma. Uh, we had flooding that happened almost statewide. I mean, sometimes the towns were all underwater. I have family and friends who live in Fort Gibson, and they got it worse than they've ever got it before. Uh, some of my brothers, uh, my brother and sister-in-law's family, and some, or not family, that's my family, <laughs> some of their friends uh, had it up to their roof of their house. I mean, just unbelievable stuff. And it really would just tear your heart out, you know, and you, you prayed that they had flood insurance and all the things that they needed, but many didn't. Uh, you look out at Bigsby and they, a lot of the areas in there did experience some flooding, some of the, the communities there. Um, and then on top of that, that wasn't enough. We had tornadoes. And it just seemed like for there for a solid week, all I watched was the news. Uh, you might have been like me. I, I'm not a big news guy uh, normally, but when something's happening like that, I'm watching the news. And me and my wife, were, we were on Channel 6, and then when it would go to commercial, we'd go over to Channel 8, right? And then when it'd go to commercial, we'd go to 23, and then we'd go back to 6. And uh, it was kind of funny because that's all we were watching because we wanted— uh, to be safe, right? Uh, they, unfortunately, we don't have a shelter, so our safe place is our bathtub, and some of you guys probably, probably saw that news story of the bathtub's not the safest place, you know, in your house. I don't know about that, but that's where we take cover. Um, with, we had our little son this year, so we're taking cover with him. And I remember thinking, like, my goodness, this is, in, this is in, an incredible May that many of us will never forget. A lot of us, this might be the worst May some of the little kids, like, I've never seen a natural disaster before. I thought that was so funny. Like, I've never seen, many of you have lived through some, right? You've seen flooding before. You've seen tornadoes before. And so God began to work that part of our May into the sermon today. And I remember thinking, like, oh my goodness, so many people in our community, in our state are going through so much hurt and so much devastation. And I almost had the thought, like, me personally, I didn't experience firsthand because my house is in BA. I just drove to work, right? You know, the tornado it hit here, not right by my house. It seemed like it was over my house at one point, but it just didn't affect me as much. And I, I kind of was guilty about that, to be honest with you. Like, maybe I should have felt a more need. And so God began to work on my heart and then also give me a different direction as well today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open those up. We're going to jump right in. You're going to need your outline. So you got, should have got one of those when you came in. You'll need the back of that outline. We're going to jump in. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open those up. The first verse that we're going to be looking at is 2 Corinthians 5 through 7. And the funny thing was, was when these storms hit, I was watching the news, it's like these storm anchors became celebrities. And I don't know if you guys are on Facebook, but Travis Myers on Channel 6, there was memes everywhere about him. And they were, they were really funny. <laughs> they were really, really funny. Like Chuck Norris followed the news, and he left Oklahoma because Travis Myers said to. I'm just like, that's hilarious. But, uh, but Travis Myers has a donut at Hertz Donuts now. I mean, he has his own day. Like, it was so funny to see all these things. But it was because we were all engaged in what was happening. And, and the reality is, is when I begin to hit this idea of standing strong in the storm, God began to relay some things to me, and that's what I want to share with you today. And really the first thing that me and you need to understand when we face a storm, when we see the news, when we see the people telling us, hey, there's something coming your way, you have to understand what the problem is, right? Like if it's a tornado, okay, different problem than maybe a flooding. 
And you saw all the people in Bigsby filling the sandbags and all the different things that they did to, you know, make sure their house was okay. But in order to understand where we're going today, you first have to understand the problem. That's the first point on your notes. So if you're following along on your notes, the first point of today's message is the problem. And the crazy thing is, is even though there's a, there's a lot of storms like tornadoes, and we, I think we had a minor earthquake, many of you maybe didn't even feel it, uh, also in May. But even though we have so many storms in life outside that we can see coming, we see the storm front, the direction that we're going to go today is a little different because I want to talk about the storms that you don't see. I want to talk about the storms that all of us have faced at one point or another in our lives, but we didn't get Channel 6 to tell us about it. We didn't get the news anchor saying, hey, you need to get your family in the bathtub. You need to get your family down into the cellar because something's coming and you need to prepare yourself for it. And in all honesty, I wish there was a channel like that, right? A channel that all the time it's Quinn's family and everything that's going on with my family, even my newborn son and my wife. And same thing with you. I, I bet you would wish if you could tune into that channel, right? And just say, let me know what's coming so that I can understand the problem. The problem in most storms is you can't see very well. So like if you've ever been driving down the road and the rain is coming down, like it just opens up and you got the windshield wipers going as fast as they'll go, but you still can't see, it's scary. Like you're like, am I about to hit somebody? Do I need to pull over? Some of us have maybe pulled over before. My wife will not drive in rain like that. Me, I'm just like, we're good, we're all right, you know? Maybe the guys in the room are like that. But, but that's what it's like in life a lot of times. The storm is so bad, the wipers are going so fast, and you can't see anything. You're praying so hard, right? You've been on your knees, you got calluses on your knees because you've been praying so hard, but nothing's changing. Some of you just still drive, right, like me. Some of you are like my wife, you'll pull over, right? Even if a tornado's coming, you're going to pull over and sit on the side of the road. And I was reminded of this verse. And many times we hear this verse and we say, that's the solution, but today I want to give you maybe another solution. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says this. For we live by faith, not by sight. I love this verse. I love this verse. We are called to live, but what, what Christ has called us to be through his son, Jesus Christ, through the faith that we have in the Father. And, and, and it's not that we always are going to have sight of it. So it's not always that we're going to see two and three miles down the road. But here's the thing that I struggle with a lot of times. I want to see two and three miles down the road. So today I want to give you a, maybe another perspective than just this verse of how we can do this. Many times in the storm, what we begin to do as people of God, as followers of God, we begin to believe the lies of Satan. We, we begin to get in the storm, we can't see, maybe our Bible's over on the nightstand or whatever, and, and we're just kind of huddled and protecting our family, protecting ourselves. It might be emotional, it might be a physical storm that you're going through, and all we know to do is just hunker down, right? And when you're hunkered down, you're not praying, you're not reading, you're not seeking, and what begins to happen is the evil one begins to throw things at you. You're not strong enough to conquer this storm. You're not strong enough to carry your family through this. That son or daughter that's going through this thing, you don't know how to handle that. And you begin to be thinking, you begin to hear the lies of Satan, and they begin to almost become truth to you. No, I really can't. I can't help them. I can't even help myself. If people only knew the struggle that I had. Uh, you know, we have this identity that if, if we follow God, we won't have family problems. Like, if, I, if, I'm a, if I'm a Christ follower, my family's never going to have a problem. And you guys are all smiling right now. You know that is not true. We're going to have problems. And then we, we think, man, if I follow God, I'm always going to be happy. Like, I'm going to walk through, ha uh, walk through life with a smile on my face 24-7, right? Like, I'm just a Christian happy guy just walking around. That's not the case. Sometimes we're sad. Sometimes uh, there's things that hit our lives that really affect us. And so really the point that I'm kind of getting to today is the problem is not more faith. And sometimes it is. We need more faith in our life. But today the problem isn't faith for more sight. That's not the direction we're going today. And the reality is you are always going to have problems in life. And myself as well, I'm always going to have problems in life. The world is always going to have problems, no matter if you're a believer or a non-believer today. And just like the storms I just said, there's those that you see from afar off. It's easier to see. It's easier to prepare for. And honestly, the storms that happened, the flooding and the tornadoes, it's even easier to clean up. It's even easier to get help. 
Because communities see, oh, a tornado hit here. Oh, flooding happened here. And then they'll send resources. They'll send people. They'll take mission trips. But the storms that you don't see are harder. They're, they're harder to see coming. They're, they're harder in the moment to handle. You don't know where to turn. You don't know what way to do. The, the preparation is hard. And then the reality hits. The recovery is even harder. Because a lot of times people don't know what you're going through. A lot of times you are so ashamed that you can't ask for help. Because why would they want to help you through that? And so the storm that we're talking about, it's, it's the times that you went to the doctor for a checkup. And they gave you the news. They gave you the news that you have cancer. That's the storm I'm talking about today. It's the time that you're walking through a season of life and depression hit like you've never known before. You didn't want to do anything when you got home. Your kids are hanging on you. Dad, mom. And all you have is a blank stare. You, you don't want to do any work around the house. You just lay on the couch because you don't know what's going on and depression has hit you. Or the time that addiction hit and that thing that used to be not so big is now the biggest thing in your life. It, it has control over your life. You don't even tell it what to do anymore. It tells you what to do. And so addiction has taken over. The storm is hard. It's raining hard. The thunder's hitting hard. And you don't know what to do. Or maybe, just maybe, maybe you experience some family loss. And you're walking through grief right now. Maybe that family member died months ago, years ago. And you're still walking through the grief of what do I do and how do I overcome this? And that storm for you looks like you could never cross it. You could never walk through it. Those are the storms that we're talking about today. So if you have your notes, go ahead and look at those. If you have your Bibles, we're going to look at three J's. I call them the three J's because it's the three stories that we're going to look at today. And it's Joshua, Joseph, and Jesus. So I'm going to walk you through three stories very quickly this morning. And I want to share with you what God has shared with me. So the story of Job, if, if you have your Bibles, you can open up with me. Job 1, verse 10. In the story of Job, many of us already know the story. We have this man of God who's living the way God has called him to live. Many of you might find yourself in the same boat. You're here this morning. The people I'm talking about are not here. You're here this morning, so you're like Job, right? You're living what God's called you to do. You're in church. You're praying for your kids. You're doing what you need to do. And then you find something that is really unexplainable that happens in your life, right? We all have problems. Well, Job had problems. And there were some things in his life that he didn't expect, and I want to show you some of those things. We, ha we have this part in the story in verse 10 where it's, it's an amazing part of the story where Satan is actually talking to God. He comes to God, and he's trying to get Job to turn, his, turn away from God. And so Satan's asking God a question. I want you to listen very carefully to this point, and we'll go kind of a little bit further with it. In verse 10, it says this. This is where Satan is asking God this. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds will spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything that he has. And this is important. He will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. So God says, okay, fine. If you think he's going to turn... His, your, he's going to turn his back on me. You have all the power you need to take what he has. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. I promise you this, and many of you know the story, Job's life was turned upside down. Everything that he once had was gone. His family, his flocks, everything he had, Satan took it from him. But there was one thing that Job never lost sight of. But I can imagine in the storm, right, that's a storm. Job actually experienced a lot of things that me, me and you will never experience in our life. Everything being gone. And in his storm, I'm, I'm sure he asked the question, God, where are you? God, I believe in you. I have the faith in you. But look at my life. What is happening? I, I've been doing what you've called me to do. But look, remember I said we all have problems. Job has Joe have some problems right now. What, are you, what do I do? I, everything I'm doing is right. I, I know it's right. But still, everything seems so wrong. And really the big question, I, I hear this from students all the time. I'm sure, just like myself, you've asked this. God, are you really listening? God, are, are you listening to me? Do you not see what's happening here? Do you not see the tears that I've shed? Do you not see the pain that I've felt in my heart? 
Do you not see the nights that I didn't get to go to sleep because of what was happening in my life? Do you not see this storm, God? And we begin to yell at God and ask God, are you listening to me? And I want to take you to the final part of this book. If you skip all the way back towards the end of the book in Job 42, it'll be on your notes. Towards the end of the chapter, we see Job's kind of come to a lesson. And in this lesson, I think it could teach us all something in the storms that we face. So this is the problem, right? That we begin to listen to the lies of the evil one. Job was very strong. Even his friends tried to get him to turn away, right? But he was very strong. And in 30, chapter 38 and 41, we see the title of those chapters, and I, I challenge you to read them later. God speaks. So God comes to Job at the end of the book, and he begins to speak to Job. And then in verse, or chapter 42, verse 2, this is what he says. I know that you, this is what Job says back to God. I know that you can do everything. A man that's lost everything is speaking to God. I know that you can do everything. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is the one who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I utter what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of my ear. I love the bottom of this verse. But now my eyes see you. So through all of the things that were taken away, taken away from Job, he comes to that point in his life where many of it's, a lot of it's restored, and he says, through it all, I see you. Therefore, I bore myself and repent in dust and ashes. So if you have your notes, go ahead and pull those back out. The problem is when we listen to the enemy instead of the Savior. And many times in the storm, it's so easy to do. But what we really need to do is begin to listen and understand the promise of God. So the next point on your message is the promise. We're going to go pretty quick through the middle part here. So if you have your Bibles, you can skip over uh, to Joshua 1.9 and stay there for a minute. So we have this part where we need to understand what are the promises of God and how do we stand on the promises of God in the storm? We understand the, prob the problem, we're listening to the evil one, because even though we've done everything right, there's a storm in our life. And a lot of times we don't deserve it, we didn't want to be there. And so the promise, the promise is this idea that you can always see God. Job gets to the end of his story and says, God, I see you. Well, what does that mean? Is God going to be standing there after the storm is gone? What does that really mean? And the, when we understand the promise, we can overcome the problem. I'll say that again. When we understand the promise of God, we can overcome the problem that is in our life. And so in Joshua, the story of Joshua is truly amazing. We don't have time to read it all today. But God had called Joshua to become a great leader. And before Joshua, I think it's one of the greatest leaders that we see in Scripture, we have Moses. Moses was leading the, the chosen people. And at that time, Moses was getting old in age. So we're going to pick up where Moses is talking to Joshua and then God's reply to Joshua. Joshua is a young man. He's, he's not very confident in what he's been called to do. He doesn't really know how. Maybe you can relate. Maybe, maybe you're a young family today. Maybe you've had that young family. Or maybe you're entering a new season of life that you have no idea what you're doing, right? So a lot of us can re relate there. Joshua is in that season right now. And, it, and you don't have to turn there, but in Deuteronomy 31, 6 through 8, we see where Moses goes to hand the keys to Joshua. He said, it's your time. I've done what God's called me to do, but it's your time, Joshua. Here's the keys. It's time for you to lead. And Joshua says, I don't know if I can do this. And Moses replies with this, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. That's so important. That God's going to go with you no matter where you go. He will never leave you or forsake you. And as you skip down to verse 8 there, this is what it says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And then Joshua, as he's going through this leadership plan, we skip down to Joshua, in, into the book of Joshua. Joshua 1, 9 says this. Have I not commanded you? This is God talking to Joshua. This is a reminder, and this might even be another point. It's not in my sermon. Sometimes godly people can, can tell you godly things, and then God can, can actually reveal those to you. So there might be someone in your life right now, a godly person that's telling you something. Like, you might can do this or give you some insight, and then God could confirm that. That's exactly what happened here. Moses has told him, here's what God says. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. It's amazing how close 
They are in that, right? That's Moses walking with God. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. The promise. God is going to be with you wherever you go. I don't care if you're huddled in the corner. You haven't read your Bible for months. Uh, you haven't prayed like you think you should pray. You don't, you don't know how to pray in this moment. God has promised. And I'll be honest with you. God does not go back on promises. God is true to carry through with the promises that he's committed to you and I. There's no, no bigger promise that we've seen than on the cross, right? Of Jesus dying for our sins. And we can hold true to that promise. I remember thinking through this part, okay, we know the problem. We know there's a promise, but what, what does that look like? And in my ministry, I've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of students. And the funny thing is, just like parents, you guys know this, each student is so different. They could be a, a, a sister of you know, someone or a brother of someone and be like, oh, you're nothing like your brother. You're nothing like your sister. And the same thing is true about their problems. I don't know if you guys knew this, students have problems, okay? They have a lot of problems. And, and, and they begin to share some of those with me. And I was at uh, another church before I came here. And one of the students that was there, man, I was on my knees all the time for this kid. He had a great family. They came to church every time the doors were open. He was a great kid. But some things in his life, some storms had arose. And it just looked like they were too big for him to conquer. I remember praying for him. And then God called me to Bethany. And I still prayed for him. But we kind of lost contact for a little bit. And it was about a month and a half ago that I got a phone call. I didn't, I didn't know the number. Um, I had his number, but he changed numbers, and he, this student had, was calling me. It was late at night, about 10 o'clock, so I answer it. And very quickly, I realized who it was, and I said, hey, how are you doing? And of course, I'm at, how's life going? Are you okay? And he began to explain to me that some things had happened in his life. And the crazy thing about his story, and I won't take long, is that God had really got a hold of him and changed his whole outlook on life. And we were thinking in that moment, God, I kind of had lost sight of that prayer. But you were still faithful to show up, even when I was just doing my own thing, right? Not even thinking, 10 o'clock at night, you show up and I receive this phone call. I want to read a quote or a, a poem that he shared with me that night that just tore my heart out. I asked him if it was okay to share it. He said it was okay. This is after the fact. After he'd walked through the storm, this is what he wrote. It says, in the morning I wake up and sigh, just wondering when I can get my next high. Every day I fear to go to hell, knowing my soul is locked up in your cell. My life was lived for your crave, thinking that my life was still saved. But looking back at my life and my story, all I can do is give God the glory. Through my mistakes, I have learned that addiction can be overturned. Although my life was in misbelief, now I wake up and sigh with relief. It was a young man who faced a great storm. And in his storm, because of what his parents had done, brought him to church, he understood the promises of God. God's going to be with you even if you're in that place you shouldn't be. God's going to be with you when you get the news it's terminal. God's going to be with you when you've lost a family member who was closer than a friend. God's going to be with you. And this is our last point today, if you have your notes. When we begin to understand the promise of God, we will find, this is the most important thing, the presence of God. The presence of God. The presence of God. I put in my notes, a plan is worthless. Throw it out without the presence of God. Men in the room, you might be like me. Something's coming your way, going to affect your family. We got a plan in place. All right, kids, get in the bathroom. I got five years of food stocked up. We're good. You know, like, you got a plan in place. The plan is worthless in these storms without the presence of God. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open those up. This is kind of one of our key passages. I'd like for all of you to turn there if you can. Mark 4.35. It'll be on your notes as well. So we're talking about the presence of God. I want to share this quote with you, T.D. Jakes. If you have your pens, go ahead and write this down on your notes. I think you'd want to keep this. T.D. Jake said it best. I was listening to a sermon that he was preaching, and this is what he said. Don't take the presence of the storm to indicate the absence of God. I'll say that again. Don't take the presence of the storm that's happening right now in your life to indicate the absence of God. So I want to dive into this story real quick, and then we'll close. In the story of Jesus, 
was teaching, uh, he was teaching and he told his disciples, hey, we're going to go to the other side of the sea. I want you to get on the boat. I'll get on the boat with you. We're going to go to the other side. So the disciples get into the boat. And what happened was, many of us know the story, he gets on the boat. I love, I'm going to read it in just a second, but I love a part in the story. It's so funny to me. I almost forgot it today, but it was kind of funny to me. Jesus was prepared for the boat, so we'll talk about that. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and look there in, uh, cha in chapter 4, verse 35. It says this, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took, uh, they, sorry, muscle thought, they took him along in the boat as he was. And the other little boats were also with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat on the, into the boat, so that it was already filling with water. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. That's the funny part, right? Like, Jesus had brought a pillow, and, I mean, it must have been really wet by this point, really soggy. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? I've heard this part of Scripture preached so many times, and many times pastors will get up here and say, you got to have enough faith because God has the power to cure your storm. He can calm the storm. The reality is that is true. God always has the power to stand up in your storm and say, peace be still. And he has the power to do that today. But there's something that I've been missing. I've read this story so many times, and God showed me something this week that blew my mind. At the very beginning of the story, Jesus is asleep. But one thing I don't want you to forget is Jesus is still in the boat. Jesus didn't jump overboard because the storm came. He didn't say, hey, good luck, guys. I'm out of here. Jesus is asleep in the boat, and remember our point. The presence of God in the storm is the most important part. Just because Jesus is asleep doesn't mean he has any more or any less power. Just because he hasn't stood up yet in your storm and said, peace be still, doesn't mean he's not present. And many times in our lives we say, God isn't by me, he's not near me. But maybe God is waiting for the perfect time to say, peace be still. And maybe God is reminding you today, no matter how hard it is, no matter how much, uh, how many things have happened in your life over the last year or maybe the last season of your life, God is saying, I'm still there. I'm right there. And maybe he's saying, maybe you should wake me up. Maybe you should try to call on me a little bit. I don't know. But I was reminded that sometimes we say, thank God is not there. And God's saying, no, I promised you. Remember Joshua 1, 9? I'll be with you. I'll go before you. I'll be behind you. I'm with you wherever you go. I remember thinking of these storms that hit in May. We'll close up with this. And I remember thinking through what this looked like from my perspective. You have the people who give you the news on Channel 6, right? They're funny. They're awesome. We, we make jokes about them. But they give us the news. They tell us what's coming. Oh, man, I wish I had that. Then you have the people, and if this is you, do not raise your hand, that go out on their front porch. There's a tornado, you know, like, and they kind of watch, you know, they're not the people like hiding in the tub like myself, but they're like the Oklahomans. Man, I think there's a storm coming, you know, like they kind of watch, you know. And then there's those people that are a little bit crazier than the front porch people that get in their car, you guys know where I'm going with this, and they chase after the storm. Like, what are you thinking? Like, this is crazy. We call them storm chasers, right? They get in their cars, some work for the, the news, some don't, some are trying to work for the news, I think. They enjoy it, I think. They go after the storm, and they know what they're talking about. Well, we got this over here, and that's, I'm like, that is just a cloud, but okay. You know, this is looking really good. I'm like, no, it's bad. It's not good. And I remember thinking, like, okay, these storm chasers, honestly, they're giving us some pretty good news. Well, this thing's in Sepulpa. It's headed this way. It's this fast. The wind speeds are this. It's on the ground. You know, sometimes in the studio, they can't even tell you if it's on the ground or not. Well, we got something. But the guys that are, are seeing it are saying, it's on the ground. It's headed your way. Take cover now. And I'm thinking, those guys are pretty important. How crazy they are, right? I would never do it, but however crazy they are. And God reminded me of this, and this is what I want to do in closing. How many of us in that, these storm chasers, they're helping people. They're telling you what's coming. How many of us, we're not in a storm right now? 
You walked through some storms in your life. Maybe last season of your life, you just got a really hard one. But you're not in a storm right now. But there's someone maybe sitting right beside you today who's going through a storm like never before. And just maybe today, God is reminding you, hey, you're kind of that storm chaser. You're the one that's going to identify some things. You've maybe walked through the same storm. Your families went through the same storm. And you're going to be the person that says, you know what? I see it coming. I even know how to help when it's gone. I even know how to help when everything kind of lands and no one seems to be there anymore. I can help. Maybe God today, maybe you're not going through a storm. You say, Quinn, this sermon ain't for me. I think the sermon is for you. Maybe God's calling you to be that storm chaser. No, don't go get in your car and sit, chase storms. But maybe God is saying, you need to talk to somebody about their problems. Or maybe you're the one that has the problems. You need to start talking to somebody. Maybe in this church, maybe in your group time, I need some help. Cry out to those around you and help. Because sometimes it's the people in the boat with you that can show you that God is present. It's the disciples saying, you know what? God is with us even if he's not doing what we think he should do. If you have your notes, this is the final point. We'll close with this as the band comes up. Sometimes you just can't go over, around, underneath. Sometimes God has called all of us to go through the storm. And going through the storm is the hardest part. And so I want to make sure you remember this point. It's your final little sentence on the bottom. The presence of God is in the middle of the storm. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the simple but true message that your presence is the most important part of it all. God, we all have problems. Sometimes it seems like some of the problems that we have are too big to even overcome. Maybe there's someone in the room today that they've got the news that I just mentioned. They have the son or daughter who's struggling through something. They have the depression, but they've never, they haven't told anybody. They put a smile on. They act like, act like everything's okay. And maybe today, God, as we sing this final song of praise to you, maybe today they just want to lift their hands and say, God, remind me of your presence today. God, if there's anyone else going through the storm today, could I be the one that maybe helps them? Could I be the one that helps them to see it coming, and even to clean up afterwards. God, today my prayer is for your people, that no matter where, you, where they're at in their life, that they would seek your presence and they would seek your face. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand?